to see. A lot of people still sitting in the last session of the day. Uh, Dr. Sampat Kumar, along with uh, me, we will invite the speakers now. The first speaker for the session is Dr. Gautam Das, who is director of the Daradia Pain Clinic in Kolkata. He is going to give his talk on management of vertebral compression fracture in osteoporotic patients. Dr. Das, please. We will have 15 minutes uh, for this presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I should uh, convey my thanks to the organizers, Dr. Nila, Dr. Joy, Dr. Romi Singh, for inviting me here. And uh, we had a very successful and uh, this pre-conference workshop on Thursday. We had four vertebrates in uh, different patients. And uh, this uh, lecture is basically an extension of that. My topic was given as a osteoporotic compression fracture, but uh, osteoporosis fracture, I feel you know more than me. So I'll be just keeping those slides. I'll be concentrating mostly on the different interventional part. And it is uh, very happy to see that uh, the physical medicine people are doing a lot of interventions nowadays. Uh, pain and uh, the rehabilitation go goes very close hand in hand. And, uh, we cannot think of one alone uh, without other. <coughs> but just I'll be telling what, one thing, because I was going attending some of the lectures, that there is no scope of doing any blind techniques nowadays. So like uh, I was seeing one cervical epidural, one caudal epidural. So none of these uh, procedures should be done without any image guidance. I'll be just telling you one uh, complications. It was uh, there in the uh, in Calcutta itself. One of our renowned pain physicians was doing one caudal epidural, and the patients landed up with the quadriplegia because you know the there is the epidural space is very rich venous plexus, and these are continuous throughout the prevertebral venous plexus, and arterial venous malformation is quite common there, and there is a possibility of this kind of complications. And uh, recently, not very recently, almost two years, in 2014. Uh, US FDA, the, there was a circular by US FDA telling that they don't recommend epidural steroid injection. And the reason was the increasing number of complications noted. We might be, uh, the, we might be blessed that the no complications happened in some of the studies, but it can happen anytime. And it is no longer recommended that these procedures, most of these interventional procedures should be done under some kind of image guidance. Very simple role is spine should be done under CM guidance and peripheral joints and other areas should be done with the USC guidance. And another uh, things I was going through this two slides, uh, two papers, that the epidural steroid is given was 80 milligram. Again, the dose of the steroid should be limited to 40 milligrams. So earlier studies was telling that, that 80 milligram could be better, but nowadays almost all recent studies are telling that there is no difference between the 80 and 40 and the total steroid dose would be limited. Anyway, coming to my topic about the osteoporotic vertebral compression fracture, you know what is osteoporosis? It is the reduction of the bone mineral. And uh, uh, you know the calcium uh, metabolism in the blood, uh, there are three main areas. One is gut, one is kidney, another is bone. So calcium is one of the very important mineral in our body, required for almost every enzymatic actions. And the blood serum calcium is maintained by anyway, by hook or by crook. So this calcium can be coming mostly from the bone. So there are two ways of transfer of calcium and the bone. So the osteoclastic activities is increased, and then the calcium level will be increased, serum calcium level, and whenever it is required, the, the two hormones, the parathormone and the calcitonin, the acting opposite directions. The calcitonin is uh, including, uh, increasing the serum, uh, the bone calcium from the brush in the serum and the parathormone is opposite. So this is the most important, the key factor to maintain the serum calcium. But again, the gut is another, where the vitamin D3 has the action and the kidney, where the parathormone has the action. So the blood calcium level is maintained mostly the, by the mobilization of the calcium from the bone. And there, the two important factors are important. Now, when, what, uh, what are the factors which uh, reduces the bone calcium? So basically, the bone calcium is what is most important factor in the osteoporosis. There are lots of factors. The point which, which I'll be highlighting 
is the last one, the immobilization. Because if there is a fracture, the most important limiting factor of mobilization is pain. And if we cannot correct pain, the patient will be immobilized for the longer time, and that will be increasing the osteoporosis further, and the more chances of the fracture in the adjacent vertebra. The, it has been very, very commonly seen that the patient was having one level fracture, patient was forced in uh, bed rest because of the pain, they cannot be mobilized, and this patient is coming up with the uh, fractures in the ad another adjacent levels. Uh, the risk of the different spine is one of the common. This is how to make a diagnosis. And how to the investigations to be done in the vertebral compression fracture is a uh, plain X-ray, uh, CT scan sometimes, uh, because they can have the better bony architecture. MRI, MRI is very important if we are taking the decision of doing any interventions because MRI will be telling us whether this fracture is active or not. Many times we get the coincidental findings that somebody is having the vertebral compression fracture, but uh, that might be old one. Old vertebral compression fracture itself does not produce pain. It might be producing pain because of the other deformities and other, other reasons, but the fracture site itself is not painful if the fracture is older. And uh, we should be knowing this by looking at the T2-weighted image. If the vertebral body has the edema, that indicates that it's a recent fracture or a re-fracture, which actually patients uh, should, should be treated. DEXA scan also should be done because not just stabilizing the fracture, we have to also look for the osteoporosis to prevent the further fracture. So if we are going for the management, one is the conservative management, rest, again I was telling that many of the patients are forced for the rest, but rest is one of the very important determinant whether there will be osteoporosis will be further progressed or not. Analgesics, particularly the opioid analgesics, and different drugs which reduces the osteoclastic activity. And three important drugs are here. One is estrogen, the bisphosphonate, and uh, uh, osteoclastic, uh, osteoclastic activity, uh, estrogen and bisphosphonate. And for the increasing the osteoblastic activity, the two drugs are anabolic steroid and recent one, teriparatide, which is again very important drug, which can increase the osteoblastic activity. Surgical management sometimes needed, particularly when the compression fracture involves the spine, involves some of the nerve root, the uh, surgical stabilization is required. And interventional pain management is very important to mobilize the patient early. Rami communicants block is one of the recent interventions which is uh, getting popular for the vertebral compression fracture. We know that the Rami communicants is the fiber which starts from the nerve root. So it starts from here and it is a, it is a uh, fiber, sympathetic fibers, which is joining this nerve root up to the spinal, uh, the sympathetic chain which is there in the antilateral, uh, uh, antilateral aspect of the vertebral body. So the needle is placed in this area at the middle and the local anesthetic steroid or the radio frequency can be done. If uh, the Rami communicants fibers is blocked, the pain from the vertebral uh, body, you know that the vertebral body is inhabited mostly by the sympathetic fibers, which is ultimately sending the signal to the brain via the Rami communicants. So the Rami communicants fiber, if you are blocking, a patient is having the excellent pain relief and there, that is a simple procedure which can be done. And another is uh, beyond doubt, the vertebral compression fracture, the vertebroplasty is one of the very important uh, modality. So here we are injecting a bone cement and uh, purpose is mostly the pain palliation and mobilizing the patient early. So it has done first for the uh, hemangioma, cervical hemangioma, now it is not done. And most important other uh, benefits might be there, but the most many important benefit is the pain relief. And commonest is your know, osteoporotic compression fracture. The patient is telling the better result if the patient is having a recent fracture of less than two months duration. Older fracture, where the patient is having more than one year, have the less chances of the success because the pain is because of the different reason, not for the fracture. Mm, the other different, uh, the patient selection criteria is uh, medications. Mostly it is done by the, without giving any sedations, without giving any anesthesia. Those patients who was there, those who, uh, participants who was there in the, our pre-conference workshop, they have seen that I have not given a minimal sedation and all patients, four patients we did, and all patients cooperated nicely. Uh, liberal local anesthetic should be given, that's all. Uh, P procedure, again, the MRI is one of the very important to, de uh, to decide if we wish to go for the vertiplasty. Uh, the, as we are telling, general anesthesia is not required, even the just liberal local anesthesia, no sedation is even required. Monitoring is important because there are lots of severe complications like paraplegia and the um, embolism and death. 
These are the different kits available where we can deliver the cement with the, using the kit. But here in our uh, the workshop, we didn't use any kit. Uh, manually, if you're avoiding the kit, we can save cost. The kit, kits are costly. So the cement mixture, there is a polymer powder and the monomer liquid, and there is opac opacifying agent. It looks uh, dark in color. Um, so this is how the cement, the needle should be placed first through the pedicle. It's a better approach because even if it is, there is a leak of cement, the leak should be through the pedicle, not uh, going to the other side and having the less complications. And uh, the needle after placing into the anterior third of this vertebral body, the bone cement should be injected. And the other different uh, the examples, sometimes we are doing multiple level. In one patient on our P-conference workshop, we did it in two level. The complications are mostly the minor, but major complications like paraplegia and death might be there. The bone cement leak is the most important thing. Minor leak is not important, but if it is a major leak, immediate surgical decompression should be done. And if there is a major uh, the embolism, pulmonary embolism, uh, that is again might be the devastating. So this is a minor leak, not producing any complications. And uh, these are the minor the embolizations, which does not produce any problem. This is a major leak, which can produce complications, uh, including the paraplegia. It is very effective, and uh, particularly for the osteoporotic compression fracture, pain relief is immediate. We can allow the patient to sit within few hours, having excellent pain relief. Um, uh, success rate is nearly uh, 90%, and mechanism of pain relief uh, by vertebroplasty is internal splinting. The complete uh, conclusion, the vertebral compression fracture should be treated in many ways, and uh, uh, one of them is vertebral, uh, vertebroplasty because uh, that is uh, giving immediate pain relief and early mobilization is possible. So this is one conference of uh, uh, International Conference on Recent Advances in Pain uh, in Calcutta, August. I'll be inviting all of you to join, and PMR and pain management specialists should be joining hand to work together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gautam. Uh, the paper is now open for questions. I think you have an interesting topic that uh, we deal with osteoporosis. Almost every physiatrist is seeing a lot of patients. Of uh, How many cases you have done uh, so far uh, regarding the compression fracture? What is the commonest age you come across for uh, vertebroplasty? You see, the, as I told, that the vertebral compression fracture does not mean that we should be going for the vertebroplasty. Conservative management should be tried. And uh, the age is definitely the elderly population is most common. Mostly, uh, whatever we do is mostly above age of 60. Younger populations, uh, the osteoporotic compression fracture is uh, really there. Traumatic fracture might be there, but the traumatic fracture is not one of the indications for doing the vertebroplasty. So the most population, the age population is elderly populations beyond 60 years of age. Any rehabilitative physical modalities you will advise following the uh, as, as I told you, the most important part is your early mobilization because immobility is one of the important factors which aggravates the osteoporosis. So immediately after doing the uh, vertebroplasty, patient can be mobilized and uh, then all other kind of the rehabilitation program can be started. It's not that the vertebroplasty is the treatment for the osteoporosis. We have to treat the osteoporosis as well, and you are the better person to treat the osteoporosis. So after doing the pain relief and mobilizing, this patient should be uh, kept for the rehabilitation for the further management of the osteoporosis. Okay. Okay. In young age, uh, in post-traumatic uh, compression practice. Yes, post-traumatic, why we avoid vertebroplasty? Because post-traumatic fracture is not wage fracture. Post-traumatic fracture, the posterior cortex are commonly involved. So if the post-traumatic fracture, after the conservative management, patient is not, uh, the pain relief is not there, it's not healed nicely, then we can consider vertebroplasty, provided the posterior cortex, which is forming the anterior spinal, boundary of the spinal canal is intact, then only we should be injecting. Uh, so those who are there in the workshop, they have seen that sometimes when you are injecting, the bone cement might be coming quickly into the posterior part, and there is a more chance of leakage of the bone cement into the spinal canal, which can lead to the paraplegia. So that is the reason why the post-traumatic fracture, it should not be done. But if the posterior cortex is intact, if the conservative management has failed to relieve the pain and the other disabilities, definitely these patients can also be taken in the younger age group. How, uh, Dr. Gautam, how does the uh, vertebroplasty uh, procedure uh, in 
impact the management, the pharmacological management of osteoporosis? Do they go hand in hand or th does there need to be? Pharmacological management should be continued. It is not that you have done the vertioplasty and the pharmacological management need not be taken. It is most important part as I was telling. And very frequently we see that not one level, multiple level. So if you are, as I was telling, the pharmacological management the other non-pharmacological management of the osteoporosis should be continued. So this patient should receive calcium. This patient should receive some of the drugs which is reducing osteo, uh, uh, increasing the osteoclastic activity, increasing the osteoclastic activity, reducing the osteoclastic. Sorry, yeah. like bisphosphonates, yes. like the estrogen. These the drugs should be calcitonin. This should be given along with that. The vertioplasty mobilization is the most important uh, factor why we are doing vertioplasty. If there are no more questions, thank you. Thank you, okay. Dr. Gautam, for that excellent and crisp talk on uh, vertebroplasty. Okay, thank you very much.